Today I'm going to be telling you how to build sophisticated software-defined networking applications out of independent modules written in a novel domain-specific language embedded in Python that's available for you to download at the URL on the slide to either side of me. So quick review, software-defined networks or SDNs, what are they? Well, they're one attempt to enable innovation in and easier management of networks by providing a clean split between the control plane, which determines network policy, or how packets will be handled in the network, and the data plane that actually realizes that packet handling at line speed and hardware. And this is achieved by providing an open standard API that the control plane can use to manage the data plane hardware, which lets us move from a world of distributed localized logic to one in which we can write network-wide applications that run on a logically centralized controller platform. So the particular API that's made all this innovation pop possible is the OpenFlow um, protocol developed at Stanford, whose usage I'm going to demonstrate in the context of the simple network shown on the two screens. We've got one SDN switch in this network, denoted by a gray square attached on port one to the wider internet, and ports two and three to servers A and B, respectively. And we'll return to this network over and over again. So let's write a simple open flow program, UIP routing, shown in the green box. Each line or rule in this program has a pattern that determines what packets are going to match the rule, an associated action to be done if the rules match, and priorities that disambiguate between rules with overlapping patterns. Because one of the limitations is that we only get one match in the flow table before our packet leaves the switch. Sorry about the animations there. And finally, one last thing we've got are counters for each rule that we can use for doing network monitoring and so forth. So how does this particular program work? Well, our top and bottom most rules at highest priority are going to match the destination IP A and B and forward all traffic, all packets with those headers, out ports two and three respectively. Our middle rule is going to match all packets but since it's at lower priority, it's actually only going to match all packets except those going to A and B. And those packets are going to get forwarded out at port one. So it's a little bit convoluted, but we've managed to write an IP forwarding router in OpenFlow. And what's really neat about OpenFlow is that, hey, if we want to use a very similar set of rules, this time written in priority order, all we need to do is change the pattern we're matching on from IP address to hardware MAC address, and all of a sudden we have an Ethernet switch. Likewise, if we want to build a traffic balancing component, all we need is to do matches on perhaps source IPs and desk IPs simultaneously and choose a different action, modify, instead of forward. So in this way, OpenFlow lets us manage a wide range of different network hardware in much the same way that an assembly language lets us manage a family of microprocessors. And this is something necessary in order to realize the full vision of SDN. But it's not sufficient. Just like we don't develop complicated, complex software systems in assembly today, OpenFlow probably isn't the best choice to build a robust, large, complex network system. Which leads me to the question that I'm going to be addressing in this talk, which is how do we design a language for programmers to use that's both modular and intuitive, but, gives, but provides the full power to program the network? And this isn't a trivial challenge. Consider the two snippets that I've shown you before, the balance and route snippets written in OpenFlow. Let's say we want to do a simple form of composition. We just want to sequentially compose them. So first we're going to balance, and then we're going to do routing on the output of the balance module. How might we get these rules? And remember, we only get one match in the table. Well, if we put our balance rules at higher priority to our routing rules, we'll end up balancing, but no packets are going to get forward, and vice versa. In fact, because we only get to match on one rule, the only way we can achieve the desired functionality is by writing a new set of rules. And so far as I'm aware, there's no controller platform today that offers an automated general solution that covers even this simple version of composition. But our Pyretic system does this and far more. The way in which Pyretic approaches the problem is by providing abstractions to the program. The first abstraction we provide is we abstract the notion of policy to bring it up a little bit higher, which lets us provide sequential 
some parallel composition operators that let you do all sorts of neat functional composition. But we don't stop there. On top of that, we provide a network abstraction that lets you move away from working on the concrete network and lets programmers actually decompose network software logic based on topology and by working with hierarchies of abstract topologies or abstracted networks. And finally, we provide an abstract packet model that provides extensible headers and acts as a foundation for both our policy and our network abstraction. So let's give a concrete example, starting with composition. We've got a monitoring load balancer. So traffic that's going to some destination IP address, we'll call it T, needs to be balanced between servers or split between servers A and B. All other traffic needs to be routed as normal, and we want to track traffic from some IP address of interest. So it turns out we can write this in three simple, independent, reusable modules in the following way. We have a balance module, which only cares about rewriting traffic that had been destined to IP and changing it to either be destined to A or B. We're then going to sequentially compose that, so the route program, the route module, is going to get the output of our balance, and it's just going to route based on destination IP. Finally, we're going to take this composed policy, and we're going to compose it yet again, this time in parallel with our monitoring code, which is going to track traffic coming in from source IP X. So this is fantastic, clean, concise, and clear, but it's, it's just the beginning. Let's look at topology abstraction example. So here we've got a legacy network, an IP core connected to an Ethernet island by a gateway node, all legacy components. And we want to upgrade our network to SDN transition it there gradually. So what we're going to do is replace the most sophisticated box, the gateway box. But this box is really rather complicated. Sometimes it's going to act like a legacy switch, other times like a legacy router, other times like an end host responding to ARP requests to the gateway address, and yet other times like a hybrid between a Mac rewriter and a legacy switch or router. So we could write one monolithic program to get this done, but as you can tell, it's going to be kind of complicated and pretty special purpose. But it turns out by presenting a different topology view, one of three switches connected in serial instead of a single one, we can radically simplify the design of our hardware. We have one module that does Mac learning and runs on the switch attached to the Ethernet island. Another module that's legacy, an SDN legacy um, routing module that runs on the switch attached to the IP core. And finally, in the middle, we can run a forwarding module with radically simplified logic that simply responds to ARP requests and does Mac rewriting. So we're able to really decompose this functionality instead of using topology abstraction to provide for information hiding for multi-tenant scenarios or as a neat way to build a network test bed, we're actually using it as a way to structure our program, although our techniques can be applied to those domains as well. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to be telling you about Pyretics design and how it supports these abstractions and what underlying concepts we use to build them. And we'll do this by building a set of completely concrete examples, starting first with our monitoring load balancer which I'll build to by introducing the notion of policies as functions, which we'll then use to define our composition operators with absolute precision. And it turns out we'll be able to apply these to querying as well by conceiving as queries as just a type of Boolean. Having shown you how to write static policies that don't change, I'm then going to show you how to write a dynamic policy whose forwarding patterns change over time by showing you an implementation of the Mac learning module shown in our previous slide. And then finally, I'm going to introduce Pyretics abstract packet model and implement using that and just features I've already shown you, topology abstraction as just another Pyretic application. No, nothing extra needed. So let's jump in and look at perhaps the simplest Pyretic policy, drop. And this policy takes a packet and throws it out, just like the open flow drop action would. It's written, or its syntax is given, as drop, and its meaning or semantics are specified by describing what happens when we evaluate it. Specifically, if we evaluate drop on a given packet, the output is simply the empty set. So we're throwing the packet out. Let's see how this works with, say, forward. 
So the goal here is to forward packet.forward A. Well, we're going to write this forward A, and we're going to give it semantics by saying, we evaluate the policy forward A on a packet. Where we're going we're to return a set of packets that's just the single packet identical to our input packet P, except whose output field is set to the value A. And note here, pyretic packets, all pyretic packets, are located packets. That is, they contain virtual header fields corresponding to location information. The switch, the import, and if applicable, the outport. And in order to get the full power of OpenFlow behind us, we're going to provide one pyretic policy for each OpenFlow policy. So we'll have a pyretic flood policy, a pyretic modify policy that changes a header equal to a new value. And each of these is simply going to output a set of zero, one, or more packets, which leads us to our general definition of all policies in pyretic, which are just simply functions that take a packet and return a set of packets, whose semantics, whose meaning can be completely specified using an evaluate function. And this is fantastic because by doing this, we allow the programmer to focus on the meaning of the programs they're writing as opposed to the mechanics of implementation, the low-level details, which low-level rules, at what respective priorities, installed in what order. And this also enables us to concisely and precisely describe and define our composition operators, which I'm doing right now. I won't take you through the uh, formal text, but informally, parallel composition does the actions of multiple policies simultaneously, where sequential competition has one policy applied on the output of the previous, which allows us to, say, write our IP routing program in Pyretic using parallel composition and the application of logical predicates. Note, we no longer need any kind of indirect specification through priorities. We write exactly what we mean. So one last thing I need to tell you about, which is how we can do our querying. And Pyretic takes an interesting approach here as well, conceiving as a querying operation as just forwarding packets, not to a concrete port, but to a bucket which is an abstract location corresponding to a data structure that stores packet data and has associated callback routines. So concrete example of this, we set up a bucket that is going to count all packets coming into it, and it's going to call back, providing the counts, every one second. We'll register a callback method with it, in this case, just printing out the counts every one second. And finally, we'll forward packets into that bucket so we'll direct packets to the bucket, and we can choose the packets that we want to go in there by just applying a predicate. So source IP equals X, we send the packet, otherwise we're not going to count it. And we've almost got our monitoring load balancer. We've already written our monitor and our route modules. Let's look at the balance module. It looks a lot like the OpenFlow snippet before, except it's got one additional sub-policy here, no longer rule which says those packets that don't match destination IP, well, we don't want to drop them, but we don't want to change them. So we'll apply the identity policy, which now lets us write balance sequentially composed with route. So all packets go in, either they get balanced or they're left unchanged, then they're routed. And all of that is taken in parallel composition with our monitoring code. One single line, absolutely precise, and far more modular than what this would look like today. Uh, even a bit cleaned up in a modern controller. So, having shown you how to write a functionally composed application whose forwarding behavior doesn't change over time, let's talk about a program that's a bit more dynamic. And how do we do this? Well, conceptually, it turns out to be really simple. We can think of a dynamic policy as just a time series of other policies, which leads us to a very simple implementation strategy. We can actually use basic Python features to do this. No addition is needed to the pyretic language. I'll show you this in the context of a Mac learning module. So here we're going to declare just a standard Python class for our learning switch that's going to encapsulate our time series object. We're going to set up an initialization method that's called whenever we create a new learning switch object, which encapsulates the time series. Here, setting, a setting up a bucket 
that's going to call back every time a packet with a new source MAC is received by a given switch. We're then going to register an update method, which I'll show you in a moment. And we're going to initialize the value of our time series to simply flood all packets and forward, and, uh, forward our queries. So we're going to flood and query. The way, in case you're not familiar, a Mac learning switch works is it starts out by flooding. And over the course of time, it learns the correspondence between MAC addresses and ports and changes its form and behavior accordingly. And that's precisely what our update function is going to do. It's going to take this new packet, which we're going to learn from. It's going to update the current value of the time series by setting it equal to a conditional statement. The condition is basically, if the packet matches the new map we're learning, then we're going to forward it out to the port that we've learned it's coming from, which is the in port our packet came in on. Otherwise, we're just going to use the policy established by the previous iteration of our time series. And what's really neat is this conditional statement is simply some syntactic sugar that compiles down into a policy I've already showed you how to write. So finally, I can tell you how to build a topology abstraction in the context of a big switch example. But first, I need to introduce one more thing, our pyretic packet model, which has all the same fields that the OpenFlow packets do, as well as the location fields I already mentioned to you. And it's a completely virtual field that the programmer can arbitrarily specify, here vSwitch or virtual switch. And finally, we get stacks of values. So we can actually push and pop values onto each header field, which turns out to be really neat for topology abstraction, as I'll show you. A given policy works with the topmost value in the stack, well, the topmost value currently. And implementation-wise, one strategy for doing this is we simply keep a mapping in the controller between our extended field values and some spare header bits, probably VLAN tags in our current implementation, maybe MPLS labels if we need more. And those are what's carried across the wire, assuming that's necessary. So. Let's talk about the one big switch transformation that I'm going to show you in detail. This transformation is one of our simplest, and essentially we present one big switch, here V, in the derived network, whose ports one and two correspond to boundary ports in the underlying network. So V1 maps to S1, V2 maps to T2. And what's really neat about this example, among other things, is that if I write a SDN middle boxing application for a single node, and I run it on the one big switch, its logic will automatically get distributed across the underlying nodes. So I get centralized implementation using a, I get distributed implementation using a centralized paradigm. So how do we do abstraction? Well, all abstractions will use this function abstract, which simply is going to return a new policy. It's going to take in several policies, which I'll tell you about. It's going to return a new policy for the underlying network written only in terms of nodes S and T, that does the same thing that running the derived policy on the derived network would. And the way in which we make this chug is by providing the topology transformation specification in the form of three policies, auxiliary policies. Ingress, which determines how packets coming into the network will be handled and tagged. Fabric, which is going to determine, sorry about that, how packets will move through the virtual switch by being routed through the underlying switches, and egress that determines how packets will be treated when leaving the network. So let's actually implement this in terms of features I've already shown you. We've got a packet that arrives at switch S port one. We're going to note that, that corresponds to arriving at virtual switch V port one. And in fact, the first thing we'll do is apply the ingress policy, which is just going to push V and one respectively onto the switch and import stack. Then we're going to use our plain vanilla sequential composition operator to have the derived policy run on this new packet. And this transformed packet, its topmost headers are all that the derived policy looks at. So it doesn't care if this is an abstract switch V or if it were a concrete switch V. It'll behave the same way irrespective. And it decides, among other things, to forward this packet out port two. We next apply a built-in function, lower packet, which is going to pop off the topmost, um, topmost location values, which correspond to location in V, 
and push them to virtual equivalence, moving our packet back down into the underlying network, where our fabric policy can then use both to route the packet across to MT and out the egress. So to wrap up, the syntax of Pyretic is eight actions, six predicates, two query requests, and five policies. This and a working knowledge of basic Python makes you a Pyretic programmer. The abstractions we provide are a policy abstraction that provides rich composition, a, compol a network abstraction that provides layered abstract topologies, and a packet model with extensible headers. We built upon insights from great pieces of previous work. Frenetic, Mestro, and Festresto in the SDN world provide some composition. Click provides full composition, but only for software that's for only only for software routers, not multiple hardware routers. Likewise, in the network world, Flowvisor, Nasir MVP, and OpenStack Quantum provide disjoint slices and topology hiding, which are useful for multi-tenancy, but not for decomposition. And that's basically it. Download our stuff, check it out, see it for yourself, and we've got plenty more on the website. Thank you. Questions? Just remember to identify yourself. Yeah, Chuck. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, Chuck from NEC Labs in Princeton. Uh, interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering, are there things you can do with the OpenFlow API directly that you may not be able to do with your higher level abstraction? Mm. I mean, going with your analogy of assembly language and higher level languages, if I need speed, I can get down to some parts in assembly and do something. So are, have you noticed anything? Well, so in terms of the things we've wanted to write, we haven't had any problems. Um, one thing I can tell you that you can definitely do very easily in OpenFlow that you can't do very easily in Pyretic is write terminally broken programs. Um, so that's, that's one thing. In terms of the capabilities, um, I don't think that there are any, um, I can't come up with an example of something that you can't um, implement in Pyretic that you would be able to implement in OpenFlow. However, there are cost trade-offs. So for example, when you write something in OpenFlow, you know exactly how many rules you're gonna be using. Whereas in Pyretic, because we're doing this composition, you can result, the compiler, the runtime system, can create cross products of rules, which will end up using more space than anticipated. So there is that type of trade-off in terms of the visibility of the programmer into what's happening on the low-level hardware. How much of an impact do you see in latency in this context? Um, la so, um, I mean, end-to-end -end latency of the packet. End-to-end -end latency of the pa packets when using Pyretic versus yeah, 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 using. Open flow um, so, in the current the current implement the current um, prototype that we have is just a simple simple uh, a simple interpreter that um, you know is used for evaluating the language. Although we've got a microflow compiler in the works that's almost ready and will be out later this month and some other even neater stuff coming after that. Um, with the microflow compiler, it should have pretty much the same performance except for on the first packet hit. When we move to a proactive compilation mechanism, you shouldn't see any performance difference. Thanks. Hi, my name is Rajesh Nishtala from Facebook. Um, my question is, how does this kind of framework affect, like latency was one of my questions, but how does it affect uh, the queuing behavior and like kind of the tail kind of performance, do you see like unusual queuing patterns that go through these switches that cause the cascading problems later down the line? So we haven't seen anything like that, but full disclosure, we haven't done testing at that level yet. Um, my expectation is that with a microflow compiler, you would see just the same kind of behavior you would end up seeing with an implementation in Pox or Nox or Beacon for any one of the, the many excellent open flow oriented programmer interface uh, runtimes available. Cool, thank you. Okay, there are no other questions. Let's thank the speaker again.